this morning we want to look at Psalm 128, a uh, beautiful psalm and the promises that are in there for those who fear the Lord, who walk according to his ways. But before we look at that, I want to encourage you to be present tonight at 6 p.m. at first and foremost corporate worship and prayer tonight and come prepared to pray. Uh, maybe have a, a favorite passage or a passage that the Lord has spoken into your heart in the most recent days to share aloud and that we might pray along the lines of God's word. And so I just want to encourage you to not only be there tonight, but be present and in, present in, in mind and heart and, and let's pray out. It's an encouragement to each other as we hear and are able to agree with each other's prayers and the Holy Spirit works in the midst of that. I really believe uh, that he leads us in prayer and he leads us corporately in prayer in response to each other's prayers as well. Uh, so this morning, Psalm 128, uh, we don't know who the author of the psalm was or what the occasion was. It's considered one of those songs of ascent uh, in leading to Jerusalem. But there's a great blessing in this psalm to those who fear the Lord. The psalmist begins to write uh, in verse 1, where he says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. We've said before that word blessed might be translated, Oh, how happy uh, is everyone. Uh, everyone, uh, meaning there's no discrimination in God's kingdom, uh, that God has proclaimed the gospel uh, uh, to, to every man, woman, and child, regardless of background, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of culture, uh, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord and it is saved, God promises here, oh, how happy, how blessed everyone will be. And he begins to describe what some of those blessings are. Uh, but notice he says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, has a reverence for God, and walks in his ways. Uh, we, we, we know that it, it's not just hearing the Word of God and saying, yeah, that's the Word of God, but it's being a doer of the Word of God. And so the blessing comes, um, it starts and begins by having a fear for God, but then there's blessing. Nicole, I just saw you come on. We want to congratulate you for your recent wedding. Uh, praying for you. Uh, we're happy for you. So sorry for that diversion there, but Nicole, I wanted to personally just congratulate you and all of those who are watching uh, can share in that that happy moment with you. So uh, blesses everyone who fears the Lord and walks in his ways. Here's how the blessings begin to meet out. Now these are general blessings. We can't take these blessings and and claim them in every situation, but but generally the person who is blessed, in other words what I'm saying is we, we, can't, uh, we can't take this to the bend of the prosperity gospel that says that, um, that you just demand from God and he's obligated to give you all of these uh, different things. Uh, but, but generally, overall, the person who walks in the God's ways, fears him, uh, will be blessed. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands, and you shall be blessed, and it will be well with you. Um, the labor of your hands won't be taken or exploited by others, but you shall eat of the labor of your hands and you shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. The song, uh, It Is Well With My Soul comes to mind as I read that. You know, the backstory of that song, how the author of that song had, had lost his uh, children, his wife, uh, but in the midst of all of that, because he walked with God and he knew God, he knew the peace of God, that it is well with my soul. So uh, for the person who has a fear of God and walks in his ways, regardless, it will be well with you. Verse 3, he says, your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children like uh, olive shoots around your table. Now, to get the imagery here, we have to understand in the East, it's very common for, uh, for vines, uh, grape vines, other fruit-bearing vines, to be planted right next to the house. And there were a number of reasons for that. One was uh, to save space in the yard. Uh, second reason was there was good exposure there, particularly to the sun, which that, 
uh, that vine would need to produce fruit. And so it would be planted there uh, to save ground, to give exposure so that it would bear much fruit. The third thing was, uh, it was just, it, it's an adornment. When we were in Israel last year, we saw some homes where, uh, many homes where the vines were planted next to the house. And, and it's an ornament, uh, and it's beautiful to see it planted there. But the other uh, thing, the last thing, was that there was protection for the vine that would keep uh, those that would come and want to steal the fruit from the vine uh, to diminish their their ability to steal it because it was right next to the house. And so that's the imagery here. He says, your wife shall be a fruitful vine within your house. Um, your children will be like olive shoots around the table. Uh, we also saw olive trees in abundance there in Israel. And the, the new trees grow up as sprouts from the roots. The olive tree doesn't reproduce by uh, by the seed as much as it does by the new sprouts growing up from the roots. It's kind of like our sweet gum trees we have here, which are, I think they they were doubly cursed in the fall because they have those little balls that drop off of them. And when you're barefooted in the yard, they, they're just a mess and they hurt when you step on them. Uh, but they also reproduce by growing up from the roots. And so, um, there that that picture is if you've seen an olive tree and you can imagine the the new sprouts growing up from the reeds it, it it grows from that that main olive tree and there's protection and there is there's uh, the right conditioning under the shade and under the protection of that olive tree and so beautiful imagery here that he gives uh, verse 5 he says the lord bless you from zion May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Now here he's talking more of spiritual blessings. Zion, of course, we know uh, is symbolism for uh, the place where God dwelt, his, his dwelling, uh, Mount Zion. And so he says, the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Uh, we can apply this uh, in our day, uh, in our lives as believers, in seeing that the prosperity of Jerusalem uh, would be, in a sense, the kingdom of God. And so blessed is the man who trusts the Lord, who fears God and walks in his ways. Um, and one of the fruits and results of that, of being a disciple, to of being a follower of Jesus, is that if we're really a follower of Jesus, if we're really a disciple of Jesus, then we're going to be making other disciples. We're going to be sharing the gospel with people uh, planting seeds, as we talked about yesterday, leading them to Christ. And we'll see that prosperity, if you will, the growth of the body of Christ. And there's nothing greater. There's no greater blessing, I think, as a believer than to be a part of others coming to know Christ and to uh, disciple them as we follow Christ, to help show them, teach them how we follow Christ. And and when we don't follow Christ, to to be honest and vulnerable with them when we fall and to share with them uh, the, the just the graces and the mercies of God in that walk. And so he says, all the days of your life, to the very end of your life, it's my prayer that I would have uh, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren in, in heaven along with me, uh, those that I've been able to share Christ with and been a part of um, Help, helping lead them to faith in Christ and discipling them to follow Christ, that they would produce other believers as being a witness. Again, our mission statement, win, disciple, and send. That's what it's all about. And then he says in verse 6, May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. And uh, as I read this psalm and I thought of that word blessing, oh, how happy, I couldn't help but think of what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. He says here in, in Matthew chapter 5, uh, it speaks of blessings. These are kingdom blessings, those who are believers, uh, the blessings that we have. Jesus, beginning in verse 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom in heaven. Now, this, this statement, blessed are the poor in spirit, is kind of counterintuitive to the world's thinking, isn't it? Uh, the world would not say that the person is happy who has, has a demeanor of being poor in spirit. No, the world 
Uh, the world teaches us, wants us to be self-reliant, wants us to be independent of God, uh, wants us to think that uh, that we have it all together and produces an arrogance and all of that kind of stuff. But, but here, to be a part of the kingdom of God, to be uh, saved, to be born again, Jesus says the person who's blessed is the one that recognizes that they are poor in spirit, meaning that they are utterly bankrupt spiritually. And that apart from God's grace and his mercy, uh, we are doomed. And so one has to recognize that they're poor in spirit before they can turn and place their hope and their trust in Christ. And the next statement he makes in this psalm is, Blessed is the one uh, are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The idea is that when we recognize that we're poor in spirit, that we're destitute, that we're utterly bankrupt, it will cause us to mourn, to grieve over that condition. And can I encourage you that, that when a person comes to that place, then, then they are ready to surrender and be born again, that they've seen that they're poor in spirit, that there is a remorse for that, and they realize that there's absolutely nothing that they can do. And really, it should be our attitude every day that we recognize that apart from the saving mercies and graces of God, that we're utterly bankrupt and should cause us to mourn. And then he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. There's something about recognizing that uh, that we are incapable in ourselves that causes us to be meek that word meek is the illustration of a of a uh, of a uh, Cheryl help me with this word that they have the bit the horse with a bit in its mouth that although the horse has all the power all the strength it's that little bit in the horse's mouth that keeps that power at harness. And so he says, blessed are those who mourn, and that brings about a meekness. If you see somebody that's full of arrogance and full of themselves, uh, they don't recognize that they're poor in spirit. They don't mourn over their condition. Uh, they're still self-reliant. And there are many in the church, in the body of Christ, who profess to be, but it seems as though they're, they're actions and their arrogance and their posturing would indicate otherwise, that they've really not come to see and recognize that they are poor in spirit, they're bankrupt, and they mourn over that condition, and there's a meekness that produces that. So verse 6, he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Oh, how happy is the one who is never satisfied with the depth of their uh, their relationship and their fellowship with the Lord, but that we that we um, thirst and hunger after righteousness. The desire there is that God continues to transform their life, continues to work in us to make us more like Christ. That should be our attitude today. That God, I'm not satisfied with where I am in my in my walk in my fellowship with you, God. Would you make me more right by the Spirit of God, not by behavior modification, as Carrie reminded us on Sunday morning, uh, but by the Spirit of God that we grow in more righteousness and hunger for that. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We've talked a lot about mercy throughout the Psalms. And here Jesus says, blessed are those who are merciful, that we have mercy on others, that we, that we don't give them what they deserve, um, that we have a steadfast love for them regardless of what their actions might be, but that we have mercy and love and we exhibit those, for we shall receive mercy. Here's that principle of sowing and reaping. If, if we display mercy, then mercy will come back to us in kingdom economics. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, again, none of us is pure in heart on our own. But there's that blessing, he says. Oh, how happy are the ones that are pure in heart, for they shall see God. If we harbor sin, if we harbor iniquity in our heart, we'll, we'll not see God. And and the, it's a figurative language here that, that we'll, not, uh, we'll not 
acknowledge or recognize his presence. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now, the peacemaker here, peace in the Bible actually means the absence of violence. And so blessed are those who display, who go out in peace, who, um, uh, uh, who, who are not vile in, or antagonistic, uh, argumentative. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And then blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, and others revile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, Jesus says. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus reminds us here at the closing of the Sermon on the Mount that, that we are of another kingdom. We are not of this world. We live in this world. We have a mission to accomplish in this world through the power of the Holy Spirit to win disciple and sin. But we have to remember our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, we may reside in the United States and we may have a residency in the United States. Uh, we're even considered citizens of this country. Uh, but our citizenship, our real citizenship lies in heaven. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people declare your mighty works, blessed be the Lord God. to the Spirit today and allow Jesus to rule and reign in your heart. He's the only one who has a rightful place to rule and reign. He's the only one who is declared Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Look to Him. May the Lord bless you and keep you. I love you. I pray you have a great day. Pray that God gives you opportunity to share Christ with somebody today.